Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope you're having a great day. Today for me was extremely productive, even though I was having okay, well, okay, a lot of technical difficulties. <laughs> With my electronics, I wasn't having a whole lot of ascension symptoms, so I was able to work and concentrate on getting myself out there a little more as far as this podcast is concerned. So I have a couple announcements to make in that realm. I do have a Metaphysical Soul Speak page on Facebook You can direct messages on Facebook to me at Metaphysical Soul. (laughs) Cute, right? (laughs) And you can also start a discussion right on the page. I would love that. I would love interaction with people who listen to my show. So that's Metaphysical Soul Speak is the name of the page. And again, at Metaphysical Soul is how you write me. Also, I will be on podcast addict starting tomorrow. So if you would prefer to listen to the show through that platform, I'll be there. (laughs) I tried to add myself to a couple different platforms. iTunes is giving me a hassle right now. Um, I think there's something wrong with their website right now. I keep trying to log in and I end up on an endless loop of I log in and then they take me to another page that says click here to add your podcast, which takes me back to the login page. And after two and a half hours of battling with this crap and trying to tell them, Hey, your website's not working. I figured what a difference a day makes. Maybe tomorrow it will be better. Someone will have seen the glitch and would have fixed it. Looks like uh, I have an opportunity to be on iHeartRadio. I've already applied. I will know within 14 days if I am approved. So I will let you guys know. I will let you know. So as it comes down the pike, I will let you know what the new platforms are. I added myself to Tumblr today because apparently my podcast could even be on Tumblr. So if you want to add me or write to me on Tumblr, I can be located at Metaphysical Mermaid. (laughs) And as always on Instagram and Twitter, I am MermaidGirl888. So... I'm not going to do a special one yet for the podcast. And in time, I probably will. But right now, I'm not. I started using hashtags effectively, finally. And I got about five new people following me, which is good because they're my soul tribe. Hashtag soul tribe. Hashtag ascension. I'm enjoying this. This is like starting to be fun again because um, I'm now connecting with people that are like-minded So that was pretty neat, but I'm trying to get my podcast out there. So if you guys want to go ahead and favorite my podcast, please, please send it to your friends that are like us (laughs) to our soul tribe, our soul family, people who are interested in cosmic ascension and transcendence and the fifth dimension Or people you know that are just interested in Sasquatch and UFOs. (laughs) All the cool and fun and weird and uniquely odd and strange things that this show is about. And that makes this show unique. Because I always have a weird story that you've never heard before on this show. (laughs) Anyway, I have a lot of material to get through today. So without further ado... I am going to get to it. Today's topic is St. Francis of Assisi. And Assisi is um, a little tiny town in Italy. If you were going to look at Italy as a very sexy leg with a shoe at the end, 
uh, Assisi is somewhere in the middle of the shin. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense to you. So, St. Francis of Assisi is not the only St. Francis I found out why, while I was researching. I found out that there's also a St. Francis of Salis or Sal, France. So, there's a St. Francis who's French. <laughs> and he happens to be the patron saint of writers, so I ought to pay attention to that because yours truly is a writer, as you know. Not only do I write the show, I'm also a screenwriter, and I write books, and I write uh, a blog. MermaidMoney.com is my blog. I don't know if I ever mentioned that before on the show. I probably did not. Um... I, I write a lot of things. I hopefully have a rewrite coming up for a Hollywood movie I was asked to do. But the writer's a little bit a little bit behind, which makes me behind. But that's okay. Because I'm having too much fun doing my podcast. So <laughs> But Saint Francis of Assisi is the patron saint of animals. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So why am I doing on a metaphysical podcast a show about a famous Catholic saint? Um, I'll tell you why. I feel in my heart of hearts that St. Francis was an absolute master of reality. And he was a spiritual master of self. He, he literally had mastery over himself which is pretty much living in the fifth dimension. That's what we're all going for. I think that if Jesus had never existed, if the Catholic Church had never existed, St. Francis would still have been a saint in the truest sense of the word. He was an advanced being of light. He was an advanced spiritual being. So, in a way, in a very real way, I believe that he belongs to the world, not just the Catholic Church. Even though that was the path he chose, and that was the path that was available to him at the time. And he was a, a really amazing person. He was smart and handsome and funny. He had a good sense of humor. Um, in his teenage years, he was a partier. He was a partier. And he was born to a very wealthy family, so it, it was like the sky's the limit as far as money. And he was very popular among his friends, and everyone loved him. He was a good guy. He was charismatic, I imagine. You'd have to be charismatic, right? In order to have friends and be popular, but also in order to start your own branch of the Catholic Church and have millions of people around the world following you decades and centuries after your death. The guy's got a lot of a lot of charisma. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you some stories from his life, and you're gonna know why. By the end of this podcast, that is my goal. You're going to know that he was a true saint. I'm sure you're going to agree with me. So, basically, St. Francis of Assisi was not born with the name Francis. He was born Giovanni. And he was born to wealthy parents in 1182 in Assisi, Italy. And they were merchants and they uh, dealt, their business was cloth, cloth that people would use to make um, beautiful, amazing, marvelous clothing, which is going to seem very ironic to you guys in just a few minutes. (laughs) That he was born in 1182 AD or Common Era. And you can 
see a movie about his life, there's a really beautiful movie. I think it's in the late sixties or early seventies. It was made maybe even in the later set. I don't even know. I think in the seventies and the director was, um, Franco Zeffirilli. And the name of the movie is brother, son, sister moon. So there's a lot of meaning behind the title of the movie. I'm not going to get into it right now, but I have a sneaking suspicion that St. Clara or St. Clare who followed St. Francis and started her own order of the church following in his footsteps, but spent a great deal of time with him. She followed him out to the mill nowhere where he lived and said she would follow him anywhere. And she gave up a life of comfort in order to live in the mill nowhere with him. And I think that she was madly in love with him, to be honest. I have a feeling that they were twin flames. They loved each other very much. They're very, very close. Even though they both lived a life of chastity, meaning they were celibate and they had no sex um, after they decided to turn to the church. Uh, I have a feeling that, I mean, twin flames don't always have to be romantically and sexually involved with each other. You know, it could be just a spiritual connection. And, and I believe, I don't know, I just, there's something in my heart tells me that this is true, that they are two halves of the same whole. So I think the name Brother, Son, Sister, Moon was a perfect name, even though um, that's not what it means or that, that that's just like one layer. There's layers to the uh, title of the movie. But Franco Zeffirelli, man, he he knew what he was doing and he did a great job. (laughs) So he was born as Giovanni. But a few years later, his dad said, forget it, forget it. I'm going to rename you. And he renamed his son Francesco or Francis, Francesco. Francesco means French man or Frenchman. And the reason is because his father loved France and loved everything to do with France. And so he's like, that's it. I'm naming, I'm renaming my son Frenchman. (laughs) And it just stuck. It just stuck. And I, one thing that I like though, is when we say St. Francis, we don't say St. Francesco. We say St. Francis and the name Francesco means Frenchman, but Francis means free one and St. Francis he was truly a free one he was a free person because God took care of him basically one day well I'm not going to get into that quite yet I'm going to tell you something about him that you may or may not know he fought in a couple wars because back in those days in the 1100s each city was like almost like a, their own country and they would have little wars with each other. So he was having, you know, he, he was just in the military. So he basically for his city, <laughs> it wasn't a state or a government military. It was like a city military. And so he went off and fought a war and then he ended up fighting in another war and he, they lost (laughs) and because they lost, um, Francis was thrown in jail for a full year. And when he was in jail, he got very, 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 very sick and he almost died. And usually what do people do when they get sick and they're about to die? (laughs) Oh God, please save me. (laughs) They start praying. They pray and pray and pray. If they were raised with faith, they pray. So he started praying and praying and praying. And while he was in jail praying, he had a dream. And in the dream, God told him he is to no longer be a soldier. 
He must give up fighting forever. And that he was also told in the dream, well, later when he got out of jail, he he agreed to, you know, yes, I'll do that. I, I'll give up fighting. And he went to this church that was in ruins in the outskirts of Assisi. And he went, and while he was in the church, he was praying again. He was so grateful to be uh, out and free and healthy again. And God told him while he was praying, you need to rebuild my church. And in the moments that he had this vision or this telepathy with God, he thought, well, he means this church because clearly it's in ruins. So while he was building the church, it struck him that God meant you need to rebuild my church. You need to really uh, basically do a whole lot more in the Catholic church. So he was still struggling. He did. He was always at odds with his father. And there was a story in which he went out into the, um, out into the mill nowhere. And he hid in a cave for like a full month. He was so angry at his dad and he didn't want anything to do. His dad did not want him to give up fighting. His dad thought that was a place of honor. He wanted him to go into the family business and become a a cloth merchant and keep up the family's wealth. And that just wasn't Francis. That wasn't his, he was a free spirit. You know, he loved joking and laughing and being out in nature. And he just felt stifled and and kind of he just felt like his parents were out of touch like all they cared about was money and wealth while there's beggars on the street that have nothing that really bothered him you know he he didn't want to be in the family business it just it didn't ring true to his soul and it didn't sit right in his heart you know, and, and so when God saved his life while he was in prison and he got out and decided to dedicate his life to God and he went out and lived in a cave for a month. And when he came back, they had such a horrible fight. One thing led to another and he ended up being chained in, in a closet. His father literally kept him in a closet in chains and It was like ridiculous. It was like the fights between them were ridiculous. So he just, when he got out of that situation, he was just like, you know what? You know, (laughs) I I don't want to be in the family business. I don't want anything to do with you. And he's still trying to hold it together. And he went to church with his family. And there's this one scene, I think it's called like the no scene. (laughs) And it's my favorite favorite, favorite part of the movie, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. But it's also one of my most favorite things that St. Francis did. Because they're in the church and they're sitting in the front and their dad, I mean, his dad and his mom and all the people, all their wealthy friends that buy their fabric and make these elaborate, gorgeous clothes, these thick, ridiculous outfits like... The, I mean, just think like, I don't know, fashion week in New York where the fabulous clothes are everywhere and you're just like, oh my God, that's like a $10,000 dress. Those are $3,000 shoes, you know, when you're just like going like, woo, look at those Manolo Blahniks, right? <laughs> Ooh, I like her Prada bag. Hey, you know, I mean, it's, it was like that kind of, it's Italy too. I mean, Italy, oh my God, it's like, Isn't that like the seat of fashion, you know, (laughs) between Milan and Paris and New York, you know what I mean? It was just like, Italy is known for that. And so it was like, uh, like kind of a la di da we're rich. Hey, we're sitting in the front of the church and everyone sees our clothes, you know, and it was that kind of a vibe. And Francis was feeling kind of uncomfortable, You know, because he turned and he noticed that in the very back of the church were the beggars and they were wearing these 
practically just like potato sacks, you know, in comparison, it's all they had. It was just like the, uh, this ugly brown sort of cloth and they were dirty and they smelled bad and they're in the back and they couldn't help it because they were so poor. And he felt really stifled by the riches of his family because it's almost like they couldn't see what was happening in society. But Francis was free of all that. He was the free one. And he he noticed it. And he just freaked out. He's like, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. You know, he walked out. He was just like, I can't be a part of this anymore. And in a way, that's God wanted him to rebuild the church. Basically showing them what they were doing wrong. It's almost like Jesus turning over the tables of the money lenders in front of the temple. Come on. You know, God isn't about the money and the material. You got to focus on your spiritual path. That was the message. And that was also the message of St. Francis. So he basically went out and he was feeling so stifled and he, he took off all of his clothes while the townspeople watched and he told his father I don't want my inheritance I don't want to work for you I don't want to make money I don't want anything to do with money and basically F off (laughs) you know (laughs) he's screaming and yelling at his dad his dad's screaming and yelling at him they're having one of their famous Italian fights (laughs) you know I'm sure the arms are flailing about I'm sure the gestures were free flowing you know (laughs) and the other people in the town just watched like what the heck and he took off every stitch of clothing completely naked no shoes no socks no underwear completely naked the only thing on his body was a hair on his head and he walked out of the town and he said i refuse to be a part of this society basically and he went out into the countryside and he lived in that old church that wasn't even a good enough shelter. I don't even think it had any part of a roof to it. It was completely in, in shambles. Well, what happened was in time, not that much time, though, just several days, everybody loved him and everyone admired him because he stood up to one of the wealthiest men in town, his father, that everyone was basically kissing his butt because he had so much money. And the, he stood by his principles and he was humble and that humility and that personal integrity that he had was so important. It was so important to him. So he basically just went out and wanted to live in the middle of nowhere. And within time, other people wanted to be with him. They wanted to follow him. Within one year, he had 11 followers. And they took in the sick, the infirm, hungry, broke people, the people that were, um, that had a mental, I don't even know if this is politically correct. Forgive me if this is not a politically correct term. I don't know the correct term, but mentally Uh, mental retardation I don't think that's right anymore but you know what I mean so people that were different differently abled people that were not mentally um, totally there people that were crazy insane obviously that's not the correct word but um, mental illness people with mental illness he took in everybody anyone that wanted to live out in the middle of nowhere with them in the countryside in this broken down church And people started building the church with him. They started helping him, fixing it. They fixed it. You know, uh, people believed in him. And he spent a great deal of his time uh, when he wasn't building the church, um, praying and meditating. And he prayed and meditated in a garden that he made. They started growing their own food. They became self-sufficient. And that's when... uh, Claire came out too and she 
also she helped him and they worked around the clock tirelessly you know trying to get everything together and they made a little community and they accepted people that were not accepted by other parts of society So I'm going to tell you some amazing stories that will knock your socks off again. <laughs> uh, you might, you should, you might just want to go buy a bunch of new socks while listening to this show. But when I come back, I'm going to tell you some stories and miracles that are incredible. After this. Hey you, have you ever thought about having your own podcast like me? Was it even a New Year's resolution? For me, it sure was. But as I've been looking into this for months, I was daunted. There's so many questions I had. When I was trying to get this off the ground, I was wondering, how do I record the episode? How do I get it across all the platforms? How do I get my podcast on Apple podcasts when I don't even have an iPhone. How do I get it onto Spotify and all the other places? How do I get people to listen? And how do I make money from my podcast? How do I edit it? Oh my God. I I had all these questions and I was so confused until I discovered the simple, simple answer is anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free, and it is ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with great sponsors, too, so you can get paid to podcast. All you need to do is record it. You don't have to go out and look for people to advertise on your show they help you so basically what I like about podcasting is I don't have to have a video of myself you don't know if my hair is dirty or if I'm still in my pajamas or even if I'm wearing makeup (laughs) haha and it's so easy I could do this from the comfort of my own home in my living room using this amazing app right from my cell phone so easy right so if you've always wanted to start your own podcast and make money by the way doing it please go to anchor.fm forward slash start That is anchor.fm slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters that are already using Anchor. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash start. I can't wait to hear your podcast and I can't wait to favorite you. Woohoo! Let's be broad, let's be broadcast podcast buddies. (laughs) I'll see you there. Okay, I'm back. So, when St. Francis was in prison, he was still just a boy. He was a 19-year-old. And that's when he decided at 19 that he was going to give up everything, uh, everything to do with money and wealth and wanted to live a simple life and work for God. That's a really young age, really young to take on the mantle, give up sex and to give up, you know, drinking and no more wine. Well, okay. It's Catholic. So yeah, he, he was Catholic. So you're not really giving up wine. I mean, let's face it. So he still had that, (laughs) but he, just it was just it, it was pretty cool i mean to be that early that young to decide that you know i mean god asked him god called him it was like literally he had the calling 
And that's why he was constantly at odds with his father after he stopped fighting. His father wanted him to be tough and strong and be a real man and take over the family business. And and that just, just wasn't his path, you know? And it's never a good idea to force your kids to do something they don't want to do, whether it's eat their peas or take over the family business. <laughs> so... You know, it just, it it never works out because your kids are going to do what your kids are going to do no matter what you say. So the best thing you can do is just let him go. Well, his dad eventually just gave up. He's like, you don't get anything from me. You don't get my inheritance. You don't get anything. And that was fine by Francis. He didn't care. You know, that's not what he was all about for sure. But... After a couple years, years and years and years of like people building the church and they did all that, he still wasn't technically, even though he was a member of the Catholic Church, he wasn't technically even going to, he didn't have anything. He didn't have, you know, he wasn't even a priest. (laughs) So he just started all this on his own, free one, you know, freedom. It was... (laughs) <laughs> he was pretty independent, you know. He just went and did his own thing. And after a few years, he and his followers decided, let's go. And we'll ask the church officially if we will um, be able to start, you know, a branch. <laughs> you know, let's franchise this Catholic church, you know, get it started, really get it going. <laughs> Uh, so he went and he talked to the Pope and asked if he could start the Franciscan order of friars and Pope Innocent said he had to Pope Innocent the third was the Pope at the time and he said he would have to think about it basically sleep on it well that night he had a supernatural dream and God told him Basically, that he was going to become a pillar for the church. That St. Francis is going to be literally holding the church up. And, they, and he showed all of the Franciscan friars holding, like, like they were the, holding the wood up underneath the foundation of the church. And he was told by God, he's going to become the foundation or part of the foundation of the church. And the next day, Pope Innocent III granted his wish, and then they became the Franciscan Friars. And during his early years, before he was really on the path, good good and strong, he still had sexual desire. He still had you know, needs. His body was just always screaming for different things. And so he wanted to kind of set himself apart and he didn't want to identify with the body any longer. And so he, you know, was, he was a teenager when he started this. Remember he was like, his hormones are raging And he, you know, he's just, ah, I can't do that. So he took off all his clothes again, again with the nakedness. (laughs) And he rolled around in the snow. And he would do that when his body wanted to have um, intimacy sexually with somebody. He, He would throw himself into the snow to get rid of his desire. And just roll around naked in the snow until it was over. And he wanted to kind of train his body. And, you know, your body is amenable to suggestion. You can make your body do anything. You can force your will upon the body and not the other way around. And that's what he did. He also wore a shirt that he made of hair that would poke him and stick at him so that he would eventually get used to not feeling his body. And then he would wear like practically a burlap bag, you know, (laughs) probably the biggest faux pas in, you know, one of the fashion capitals of the world (laughs) is to wear a burlap bag with hairs in it. (laughs) 
<laughs> but he did it. He didn't care. That's not what he was about. He wanted to basically disassociate from his body and only associate with God in his mind and his spirit and his heart. So he did these things that were kind of strange, but you know, also with the insane haircut where you know, they shaved just a circle on top and left the rest or the ring around the head. <laughs> Because he he wanted to basically symbolize, look, we take a vow of poverty. We take a vow of celibacy. We're not here for our looks. We're not here to identify with the body. We're here for God. You know, if we shave our head, maybe God's words will come in. (laughs) You know, faster, easier, something. So... Long, long, long after he had been well established in his with his Franciscan order of friars, and then later there was the monks and you know different orders of Fran of uh, Franciscan um, branches, I suppose. But in 1220, now Saint Francis died in in 12. 26. I think that makes him roughly around 44 years old. But when when he was um, so good and established in the church in 1220, he granted Peter Catani, one of his uh, friars, governance over one of the greater orders of the Franciscans. But five months later, Peter Catani died. So when they buried him in the local cemetery there, everyone would come to pay their condolences and miracles started to occur at the grave site of Peter Catani. And it became such a problem because people were being cured left and right from blindness or lameness. Um, like, you know, like lame, not lame, like, Dude, you're so lame. But I mean, like, lame, like their legs weren't working. You know, people that were crippled, people that had strokes. I mean, anything you can imagine. People that were mentally ill. And they just started flocking to Peter Catani's grave. And there were so many miracles that it started to ruin the vegetation of the town. There were so many people flocking for a free miracle. Like, hey, you know. And it became a huge issue, a big, 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 big problem for that little town. They couldn't handle having, you know, hundreds of people coming every day over there. Like, it was just a pain. So Francis had to go over there, and he literally spoke to the spirit of Peter in the grave. Look, you know, or at the gravesite. He's like, look, Peter. Thank you for doing the miracles. That was really great and all, but, you know, I don't know exactly what his words were. I'm, you know, I'm improvising here. (laughs) He said, dude, you got to cut it out because, you know, you're ruining the town. (laughs) And the next day, all the miracles ceased from the gravesite so that, you know, they could save the town. It's kind of weird, right? I mean, just like hundreds of people were being cured left and right. And it was just like, oh, my God, we need to stop this. <laughs> so, I mean, so it was pretty cool. Like, even from beyond the grave, Peter Catani was performing miracles. So I don't know if he ever became a saint, but he should have been. I, I should look that up later. I'll look that up. So, um, one time... uh St. Francis was doing a fast. A lot of the things that he did was just to get himself into the spiritual side of things and to ignore the body. And one of the things he did besides the, the hair clothing and rolling around in the snow naked was, was he would, um, fast a lot for a long time. And one time during one of his 40 day fasts, um, while in pre- preparation for Michael Mas, which is the feast day of Saint uh, Archangel Michael, or Archangel, I don't know how they how to say it. Anyway, for some reason they they considered Archangel Michael a saint as well. 
I don't know if there's any other saints that were, or I mean, angels that were considered saints, but that was another strange thing. But um, anyway, they were getting ready for the feast of Michael Mas, which is the feast day of St. Michael, the archangel, which usually a feast day is uh, to celebrate the death, the moment that that person gets to go to be with God. And so you have a feast in heaven. You know, thou thou preparest a table in the presence of thine enemies, you know, like the idea of feasting. It's it's all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. So basically he uh for whatever reason, Archangel Michael has a feast day. I don't even know what that's about. I've got to look into that because I love Archangel Michael too. Anyway, forty days he was feasting, and during that time he went and he was praying and well, okay, one could kind of say it might have been a hallucination rather than a miracle because you haven't eaten. A homeboy hadn't eaten in a couple of weeks. <laughs> anyway, he was looking at a cross and an angel pe- appeared and the angel had six wings. You know, again, you know, fasting. But <laughs> you start to hallucinate when you're lacking food or sleep or all kinds of things. But he saw this angel and the angel appeared before him and he felt that that was a miracle and that God was speaking to him through the angel and the angel touched him. And the next day he woke up and he had stigmata. He had all of the wounds of Christ. Usually stigmata is only, uh, wounds in the hands, uh, generally, you know, and it's, uh, all the wounds that Jesus sustained, um, during his death. So St. Francis ended up with uh, all of the stigmata in his hands, his feet, and even on his left, uh, his left thigh where a spear had touched Jesus. It looked like he had been uh, stuck in the leg by a spear as well. So he did receive the stigmata. And so everyone thought that was definitely a miracle. And he just had visions all the time and he had a direct connection and telepathy with God and they were always seemingly in touch. And while he would be out meditating in the garden behind the church, um, birds would come and they'd come really close to him. And after a while, they would land on him. They'd land on his shoulder. They'd land on his head and they would just hang out with him. And the beasts of the field would come out and the the deer would come up to him and he could pet wild deer because he was such a gentle, humble and sweet person that, and he felt his oneness. He felt his oneness with everything, with God, with the animals, with the sun, the moon, the trees, the sky, the forest, like everything was him and he was everything he knew on a very profound level, his oneness with the all of the all, you know, he knew the, I am that I am that I am. He knew it. You know, he experienced it. He lived it. He was a living example of that. And he had a lot of interesting things when he would utter the word Bethlehem. Honey would would like appear in his mouth. He would taste honey as if he just had a spoon full of honey. And I I I, I consider that ESP. That's Claire Gustatory. Remember in my ESP made Claire episode, we talked about that. But um, one time while he was praying inside his house in the middle of the night, he couldn't sleep, so he was up all night praying. And he was with his uh, followers. Uh, The door opened out of nowhere and a ball of light came in and it circled the room three times. And then it landed on a table. And then it just sat there and glowed for a while. And everyone realized it's because he had a pure heart. He was blessed by God. And that was just another sign that God loved him. And because he loved the beasts of the field and the men and he didn't differentiate, he knew that everyone was one. He was one with everyone. And that's why all these miracles came and everyone got to see them and, you know, they were witnesses to this. There was one time in which he was approached by a leper and a leper 
is a person who has a disease, leprosy, which is a really horrible disease. Back in, then, there was no cure for it. And I don't want to describe what happens. You have to look it up. Um, leper, L-E-P-E-R, if you don't know what that is. But it, it's a horrible disease, and it, it pretty much, I guess, zombies would be like the modern-day equivalent of leprosy. Like, they're, they're pretty much, they were like zombies. And so, basically, this guy with leprosy was begging because when you have leprosy, you can't really get a job when your skin is falling off. <laughs> so, you know, he was just kind of a beggar in the street with leprosy and, and Francis saw him. And at first he's like, Oh, Oh, oh God, you know, cause it, the stench of the disease is really horrible. And he started to run away from the guy at first And then he caught himself and he's like, Oh, what that like, that's so wrong. You know, (laughs) you know, like running away, screaming, not really the, you know, the pious way, (laughs) but just for half a second, his ego caught, you know, caught him and he started to run away. And he's like, you know what? God's going to provide me no matter what with everything I need. and, And God, God will protect me or I will be with God's sinner, you know, basically. So he decided that his ego wasn't important. His love of God and all humanity was more important. So he ran over to the leper and he embraced him. He hugged him and he kissed him. He kissed him on the cheek and he gave him money. I think, I think that's what, how the story was. If he had any money with him, he barely ever had any money. He was a baker himself, but he, hugged the guy and he kissed him and he blessed him in the name of God. And he turned to get on his horse to go, to go again on his way. And when he turned back, the man was completely gone. And later after he died and people read his writings regarding that incident, he said, I realized in that moment, that it was a test and I passed and it was Jesus disguised as a leper because when I kissed him I realized what had happened and after that he ended up working with lepers he ended up helping them he realized that was part of his calling that was part of his mission on earth part of his life purpose was to uh, help the lepers and after that, all he could feel, he claimed in his, his diary or, you know, after he died, he, and people read this, they were shocked. And, and he just, he said, all I could feel was a sweetness of soul and body. And that's all I, w- I could feel when I was around the lepers after that. Whereas everyone else is, you know, running and screaming because they're like zombies, you know, it's creepy, (laughs) you know, but he was so sweet. He was such a good person. You know, he was a true master, a master. So there's another amazing story. One of my most favorite stories called, well, I'm calling it the wolf of Jubio. There's a town uh, in Italy called Jubio or Gubio. I think it's Jubio. Jubio. Yeah, G U B B I O. And there was a wolf that decided to just basic, basically be an asshole <laughs> in this town. I mean, normally wolves are shy and they kind of stay away from men. Well, this wolf, he had some, he had some chutzpah. He went into the town and he like killed people he killed people's pets he killed people's livestock he was wreaking havoc in this town of Jubio and he was a jerk this wolf was a jerk you know and he he was creating so much fear among the people that they were afraid when the sun started to go down they would hide in their houses they would lock their windows and doors and before the wolf came around they were kind of had a free kind of community everyone loved everyone and you know they were all friends with each other everything was cool well this wolf uh 
kind of changed <laughs> their attitudes about having a free and open society, you know, where we're you know yelling out the window, hey, Bob, you know, <laughs> everyone's terrified. And when, uh, when Francis came to this town, they told him about the wolf. They're like, please, you've got to do something. We have heard that you are able to do miracles. And I know this is a weird one, but I mean, can you do something with the wolf? We're scared to death of this wolf. Well, the second he heard it, he didn't even hesitate. He said, you know what? I'm going to go have a talk with him right now. And he started walking out of the town and it's like dusk, you know, it's like dark, getting dark out. And he's going to go confront this wolf that has killed people and livestock. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but the people were like kind of staying a little bit of a, way, a ways away from him, but they were following him like this. I got to see. Right. <laughs> and so he went out to the wolf and he literally said to the wolf, brother wolf, come to me. I command you from Christ that you do not hurt me and you do not hurt anyone here. Now, I can assure you that that no one here, all the people here will ensure your livelihood for the rest of your life if you stop killing the people and the animals here. Well, the wolf... uh, gently approached him and bowed before him and put his paw up to him and shook his hand in an accord. And from that day forward, the wolf lived in the town with the people and everything was peaceful. Everyone loved the wolf after that. Everything was fine. He never killed again. People fed the wolf. And because of that, there is probably to this day the Church of Victory in the little town of Jubio, Italy. Pretty interesting, right? I mean, that one just blew my mind. Blew my mind. But he was always, always able to communicate very clear telepathically with the animals he also had another miracle in a town called Aviano and this is ironic because avian means bird Aviano (laughs) Italy he was outside on a beautiful sunshiny day giving a sermon to the people that were there They all had come out, the townsfolk come out to see him. And these birds flew overhead and started circling these big white swans. I mean, swallows. I'm sorry, they weren't white swans. That was something else. Yeah, okay, no, I'm sorry. He was, they were swallows. What are swallows? I think they're, they're, oh, swallows. I think they're blackbirds. And they're, they're very graceful, but they're, loud and they can be very obnoxious and so they they came and they started like flying overhead and they were being so loud that no one could hear his lecture so he stopped and he looked up at the birds and he said my sisters the swallows it's my turn to speak because you have already done enough hear now the word of God be silent and quiet until the delivery is finished and the birds they were quiet they were quiet and just silent as a stone until he finished his sermon and then he kind of waved his hand and they were back to being their birdly selves being loud again and it astonished the townspeople of Aviano they couldn't believe what they'd just seen that's incredible It was incredible. They said, when that happened, they said, look at this man, people. This man truly is a saint. He is a friend of the Most High. Because how how could you command animals to do your will when the only way is when your will is in alignment with the one will, the true will of God. 
And that's what he was. That's what he did. Now, there are a lot, a lot of stories. In fact, St. Francis is associated with more than 40 documented miracles that had eyewitnesses during his lifetime. In fact, after he died and they buried his body underneath the church that he rebuilt, anytime people would come there and they would pray to him, they would be healed immediately. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were healed. Now I'm going to I'm going to try to go through this quickly cuz we're almost at an hour. But I'm going to keep going because this is a very it, it just gets very interesting. So he went to Toscanella where he healed a crippled boy. Immediately the boy was made better. When he went to Nardi, he healed a woman who had a stroke and a paralyzed man and all he did when he healed these three people was just make the sign of the cross over them and that was it that's what the stories say he healed a friar who had epilepsy and no longer had he, he had any seizures afterwards in the city of Castello he drove a demon out of a possessed woman In Pomarico, there was a little girl who died, and when she died, the mom prayed intensely, you know, avidly, and and, and intensely, just please, please, St. Francis, come and help and heal my daughter. And an apparition of St. Francis appeared to her, and the little girl woke up, no longer dead. In Cesa Arunea, a house collapsed on a woman. And her mother prayed and prayed and prayed that St. Francis will intercede on behalf of her daughter. And even though the the daughter had been crushed by a house, she woke up the next day perfectly fine, as if nothing had happened. Not even bruises on her body. In Ragusa, there was a man who worked at a printing press and a pile of wood fell on his head. It crushed his head and he died. The father prayed and prayed and prayed fervently for St. Francis to help. And an hour later, the man woke up uncrushed and alive. He healed a blind woman and he healed another person, actually a blind thief in his own town of Assisi. Well, the thief wasn't just blind. His eyes, as a punishment for being such a nasty thief, he he stole from a lot of people. And, well, the townsfolk had plucked his eyes out but he still had the guts to go ask St. Francis for help and Francis granted his wish because he saw the man as a child of God just like the rest of us and he didn't judge him because Jesus said not to judge he just reached out and touched the man's head and the man's eyes came back literally he started to sprout eyes and within a couple weeks he had normal eyes they were a lot smaller than his original eyes but they were eyes (laughs) and he could see out of them (laughs) that was one of the weirder more bizarre stories I heard While praying 
during mass in the church of Assisi, a woman's head was crushed by a large stone that somebody had left on the marble um, mantle and had fallen on her. She was up near, you know, near the front and this huge stone had fell fallen and it crushed her head like crushed her head in bashed her head in saint francis uh took off his coat and laid it over the woman's body and continued his sermon at the end of his sermon he took his coat off the woman who woke up and her head was fine she was alive In in Castle Gori, there was a man who had a tumor in his leg that made him helpless to walk except with a walking stick. And his walking stick he had was shaped like a T or a Tau, T-A-U, which is um, the name of a Hebrew letter for the letter T. And he asked St. Francis for help. And St. Francis took the Tao-shaped stick out of his hand and knocked it on his leg three times gently. And the tumor went away, and he straightened up and was able to walk. And that is why, uh, to this day, the symbol of a Tao is also associated with St. Francis. It's one of his symbols. In addition to doves because doves would alight on his shoulders and land on him while he was meditating and praying just like Jesus by the way dove was his symbol as well so let's see I have one more there oh yeah okay one yeah okay so there's miracles and miracles and miracles and miracles surrounding him I mean over 40 miracles surrounded St. Francis and you know like I said also Peter Catani someone who followed Francis one of his followers also from beyond the grave performed miracles and because of this The church canonized him in under two years after he died and made him a saint. Usually it takes the church over five years to uh, announce someone as a saint and canonize them and give them a feast day and whatever. And um, it took less than two years because it was beyond a shadow of a doubt that St. Francis of Assisi was a true saint, a true master of light. Whether he was Catholic or not, he was. that's what his destiny was going to be. And the church named him on the day that they, called, they canonized him. The church called him an Alta Christus, another Christ, because he was a Christed master. Alta Christus. The day that he died was October 3rd, 1226. And one of his followers later wrote in his um, diary that when he died, he saw his soul rise up out of his body. And by the way, yet again with the nakedness, (laughs) again with the nudity, he was very, very sick. He had gone to see St. Clair to say goodbye because he knew it was at the end and she came with him and they laid him down in the church that he rebuilt and he begged he he would he would not stop saying uh psalm 141 you could look that up i'm not going to read it but he begged them please take off my clothes i wish to die naked on the on the ground on the dirt the way jesus did cuz jesus was his hero And so that's how he died, surrounded by the people that loved him, naked on the ground in the dirt. And when he died, one of his followers reported that he saw his soul leave his body 
and his soul was shaped like a star, but as big as the moon and as bright as the sun. Now, to this day, there are still miracles associated with him. If you ever need help, especially with your eyes. <laughs> and I think it's funny that all week I've been having problems with my eyes. I got stung in the eyes, in both eyes, by some kind of bug that I could not even see in my bedroom while I slept. So I've been having the name Francis keeps coming to me. Ones and fours keep coming to me. And he was reading Psalm 141 when he died. And he was like reciting it over and over again. And the very last word of, of Psalm 141 is escape. It's one of the last words, the last in the last sentence. Remember the word escape in Spanish appeared in the sky. Fugan appeared in the sky like yesterday. I think I reported that. I'm like, what does that mean? And I looked it up and I'm like, escape. It was like one or two days ago. It's on one of my episodes. I'm like, so like all these words and all these associations and numbers, everything is coming to me in relation to St. Francis. I know that now, now that I've done this research, now that I, I finally sat down and did a dedicated show to my favorite saint. And I didn't even know all this stuff before I was, you know, I knew some of this stuff. One thing I did know about him that I have been wanting to do, and I've been talking about this all week too, I just at the second realized, is levitation. He would meditate and he'd get so deep into his meditation and prayer that he would levitate off of the wall where he would sit and he would lift up, 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 up. And people would watch him and it was recorded that between 1.5 to 1.8 meters was as high as he would lift up. Now, 1.8 meters is five feet, nine inches. So almost six feet off the ground, he would levitate. He didn't even think about it. He was just meditating. Prayer was all he thought about. So pretty interesting, right? Now, when I was in uh, University of North Dakota when I was 18, and I told you guys the other day that I was in a spiritual group. We met every Sunday to talk about God and spiritual things, and the New Age movement was brand new in 1987. Well, one of the ladies that came to the group as a guest speaker, and, and, and we even had, yeah, we had speakers, but it was in my friend Don's living room. <laughs> but we, we had guest speakers and her name was Lily Francis <laughs> again with Lily which is associated with the, the country France and her last name was Francis because she legally changed her name to Francis to honor and reflect her deep and abiding love for St. Francis of Assisi and the next day, after she changed her name <laughs> legally to Lily Francis, she, w- she started waking up at night feeling really cold, like her covers were off of her, but from underneath. And this happened for several days in a row, and then she realized, and she woke up and she tried to sit up, And she was floating above her bed, like almost six feet off her bed. And she was cold from underneath her. (laughs) Her covers were hanging off of her body. Because she associated her name with St. Francis, she ended up having one of his attributes. I think she might have had more. She did. She was another one of these tight-lipped, sainted people that I knew, that I had the great fortune of meeting in my life. And she was an English teacher at the University of North Dakota. <laughs> she was a tenured professor. And while she was tenured, she named herself Lily Francis. 
and she started floating at night. She would levitate. And at first it was, it scared the crap out of her. She told us she was laughing so hard. She said it was so weird. And then she looked more into it. And that's when she discovered that St. Francis also levitated. So she got used to it. She got used to it. She figured it out. And for the rest of her life, she levitated. And she was a trip. I loved her so much. She just had the heart of that free one in her, you know, deeply spiritual. She was, um, she used to read at a, a old, um, oh, she was at a bar called Whitey's. I loved Whitey. Whitey was a great guy. I loved him. God rest his soul. And God rest her soul, by the way, she's passed. But um, Whitey was an amazing, like, when I was like a teenager, not even old enough to drink, he would still serve me beer. He didn't care. He was a great guy. He was just, he was very sweet. He always knew I was responsible and I loved him dearly. And, um, but she had a couple different places she'd go to, but she'd go to Whitey's Bar in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and she would read tarot cards. And she would um, ask for a donation of $10, but if you can't afford it, don't worry. And she would read your fortune. And she was always dead on accurate, like unbelievably accurate. And right after my friend Annie was murdered, and I mentioned Annie the other day, um, in my, uh, I was telling you guys about um, where a demon tried to possess my body, and I told you it was that it was that uh, that episode. But uh, after Annie was murdered in her bed, um, I was really upset about it. It was like about a week later, and I was really thinking heavily on it. And I walked into the grocery store. It was a new one on the outskirts of town, and. It's now as old as Albertsons. It's been there forever now. But back in the day, that was like a brand new store. And people didn't even shop out there. And she met me out there. She just, right when I'm walking in there, and she said, what do you need, dear? And I was like, how she's, she's like, hi, what do you need, dear? And I'm like, what? She's like, well, you need something from me. Otherwise, we wouldn't have run into each other like this. (laughs) And she was right on, man. She was spot on with her psychic visions. And I told her about Annie and she said, you know, she was 18 or she was 19. She was 19 years old. She lived a good long life. Some kids don't get past their babyhood and that's a tragedy. But when a 19 year old dies, that's an adult. She got to live her life as an adult for almost two years. She did what she needed to do. She completed her mission and she's fine. And it just, I felt instantly better. And she gave me this big, big hug. I'll just never forget that day. I was just like, I felt so blessed. She really helped me. She helped me through my grief in a matter of like, what, three, four sentences. So I think that anyone with the name Francis is blessed. And St. Francis was an amazing uh, master of light. He truly was um, an Alta Christus. He really was another Christ. So, you know, feel free to uh, ask him, ask him for help if you need it. I think I'm going to from now on because he's been after me for like a week to get to do the show. So I feel blessed in my heart that I got to do a show for him. I'm grateful for it. But I've given you guys a lot of fun things to think about. And by the way, I have a friend, because of that story, he named himself Alex Xander Orion Francis. And he was waiting, bring on the levitation. <laughs> and it never happened. <laughs> so if you're thinking, hmm, hmm, I'm going to go name myself Francis. I'm going to go because I want to levitate. That's not how it works. <laughs> So I, I wanted, there's that one caveat, like that one thing that maybe if you think about it, don't, don't, don't do it. Cause don't name yourself Francis. Cause you want to levitate, learn to levitate, but and maybe with this sense of, we'll all be floating around pretty soon. That'd be pretty cool. But, um, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> 
But hey, always believe in the impossible. And with that, I am signing off with peace and joy and the high vibes of the Holy Fifth Dimension. Until next time, guys. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you.